All right, in this video, we're going to make some connections to our area approximations and definite integrals. So last time we talked about if we have a curve and we're trying to find the area under that curve to the x-axis, we came up with a couple different ways to approximate. We had LRAM, we had RRAM, we had the midpoint. And in any given technique or given way to approximate, we said the more rectangles you have, the better your approximation is going to be to get the actual area. So we're going to come up with a, a technique to get the exact area. So let's say I have a random curve, y equals f of x, on the interval a to b, and I pick an x value between a and b, we'll call it x sub i. It could be I have 20 x values or 10 x values, it really just depends on how many rectangles you're choosing to approximate that area. So I'm just going to say x sub i, just so just any arbitrary x value for every x value on my continuous graph here. I have f of x i is the y value. And I could find a rectangle of any width that I want. So I'm going to let that be delta x sub i, meaning the change in x from that point. So again, I could choose that width, whatever I want to have. It kind of depends on how many rectangles I want to use, how wide I want each of them. Most of the time, we make them uniformly. Uh, the same width, but here I'm just going to say delta x sub i for any random rectangle that I'm using. So for, from last time, the whole concept was we're just going to fill this up with rectangles, add those areas together, and that's going to approximate that area. So first, let's zoom in on that one rectangle and look at its area, base times height. The base is delta x sub i. The height is the y value, f of x sub i. So if I took that area of that one rectangle, and then I was looking at the total area there, that total area would be, say, like adding f of x sub zero times the width of that rectangle at the first x value, plus f of x one times the width of that rectangle at that x value, plus all the way to f of x sub n. So x sub n in this case would be b, and x sub zero would be a, that's the starting x value, ending x value. And so I could add all of that together. A fancy way I could write that is using sigma notation. So the sum, i goes from 0 to n, of f of x sub i times delta x sub i. Kind of why I use that subscript notation there. So that would be the total area. But we know that that's not going to be the exact area. Even if we used 100 rectangles or a bajillion rectangles, that's not going to be the exact area. So the question is, how would I get the exact area? Well, if I'm looking at that expression, sum i goes from 0 to n of f of x sub i times delta x sub i, I could take the limit as n goes to infinity. If that limit exists, that would give me the exact area. In other words, if I had an infinite amount of rectangles and I add their areas together, another way to look at that is looking at the limit as delta x sub i goes to 0. If I have an infinite amount of rectangles, I'm looking at as the width of each of them shrinks to zero, essentially. So these two limits are identical. We're going to see one or the other. And this is how we're actually going to define what's called a definite integral. So that thing on the left is the same as what we had here. The thing on the right equals. Oh, that looks really familiar. It looks like an integral, except it has a little a and a little b. This is going to be what we call a definite integral. Definite integrals have a starting point and an ending point. The lower part we call the lower limit, that a. The upper part we call the upper limit. That tells us where to stop. So we start at a and we go to b. And so we've seen integrals before, but why are we seeing this connection to area? So let's take a look. Let's say that I'm looking at just a basic linear function, y equals x plus 1. And I wanted to find the area from when x equals 1 to x equals 4. So I can do that using geometry. This is a trapezoid. So I could just use the area of a trapezoid formula. Or if you want to split that into a rectangle and a triangle, you're going to get, in either case, 10.5. So what we could say is the definite integral from 1 to 4 of f of x dx equals 10.5. In this case, f of x is x plus 1. All right, so why are we using this weird integral symbol with the 1 and the 4, which is an antiderivative symbol that we've seen? Well, let's take a look at the antiderivative of that function. Again, here f of x is x plus 1. If we take a look at the antiderivative of x plus 1 using our power rule, that's x squared over 2 
plus x plus c. Let's see what happens to that answer when we plug in a 4. That upper limit looks like it get 4 squared over 2 plus 4 plus c, which is 12 plus c. All right, let's see what happens when I plug in a 1, the lower limit of integration. So in green here, I got 1.5 plus c. I wonder what happens when I look at how far apart those are, or the difference between them. So let's look at 12 plus c minus uh, 1.5 plus c. The c's cancel, and I get 10.5, which is exactly the value of the area under this curve. Kind of why we use this area under a curve to mean definite integral. So this also leads us to what's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. If capital F is the antiderivative of little f, where little f is a continuous function on an interval, then it turns out that the integral from A to B, the definite integral, turns out to be the antiderivative evaluated at B minus the antiderivative evaluated at A. So this makes us, uh, or this gives us a connection between area under a curve using LRAM, RM, all of that, looking at the limit as those rectangles increase to infinity, getting the exact area and antiderivatives. This actually is a good stopping point and should give you plenty of information to tackle those questions all on Schoology.